Hello, welcome back to A World of War. It's been three days since I last filmed, so trying to catch up. Uh, the only thing I did last time after um, finishing out is I did deploy the French fleet, which, you know, isn't too much. But um, make sure I'm recording. Um, it's basically two small, not small, but smaller squadrons of ships that I set up, one in um, Laurent and the others in Marseille. And basically it's like a couple battleships and some escorts. Not They don't have any carriers or anything fancy like that. Um, but that kind of leads us into the theme of this episode, which is uh, a little bit of naval strategic warfare. So one of the things that uh, apparently was changed in a world at war at some point, or maybe it's a difference from advanced Third Reich, is that uh, Germany can't do hardly anything on turn one uh, besides take Poland. One of the things that they can do, uh, well, two of the things that they can do is they can use their U-boats, and they can also um, try to do a harbor attack. Now, I'm going to skip the harbor attack because in the chart, it actually says that you can do the harbor attack at any time, um, but it's it's essentially freebie. So on the naval sheet here, well, strategic warfare sheet, there's a little blurb about the initial German harbor attack. And basically, it's Germany begins the game with the ability to make a harbor attack against one enemy target. This attack may be made in fall 39 or any subsequent turn, which is probably the path we're gonna take because we don't really have the ability to protect ourselves if the Brits put the sea. So, I mean, we could try attacking like the French fleet or, or something along those lines, but not so sure that it would pan out for us. As far as strategic warfare goes, the key here is we have to move our submarines into the, the submarine warfare box, the strategic warfare box, which for the life of me, I don't know where it is. Oh, I guess it's in the top left up here. So there's like a little picture. I'll, I'll zoom in on it. There's a little picture of basically the, the Atlantic. And there's also a Mediterranean and Eastern. I'm not sure what Eastern refers to, but the picture kind of has the, the Northern Hemisphere's Atlantic. So I guess we're not allowed to go into South American waters. Despite the fact that there was, I mean, that was one of the major battlegrounds early on in the Naval War was South American waters. It's kind of one of the reasons that you can even call it a true world war because of the naval, um, the naval battles that occurred off the coasts of South America, Africa. I mean, obviously Africa had a ground campaign, but South America didn't have a ground campaign, um, but it was involved in the naval war. Same with like continental U.S. Not really all that involved on, the, on a ground campaign level, obviously there were belligerents in the war, unlike most South Ameri many South American countries. They weren't necessarily belligerents, um, such as Brazil, um, but they, be like the Argentinians became involved uh, loosely because of the naval aspect. Were it not for navies, probably wouldn't have been a world considered a world war. Um, but it's, it's one of the ways the, the war got as big as it did because of the, it was the largest naval war, not just the largest ground war. So that means we need to figure out, uh, we're kind of backtracking here on the sequence of play. Um, I just wanted to get things going initially. We're fixing things as we, as we find that we, we made mistakes. But essentially, when you would normally do strategic warfare 
would be during the movement phase. Um, so you can see here, there's a, a couple of strategic warfare steps that we kind of uh, skipped, glossed over, shall we say. But now we're revising and going back um, for no other reason than it's the first turn. I had to get things set up still. We were just trying to get some, some entertainment value out of it before having to really learn the game. So I will see what we can do movement-wise. Um, so the attacker announces naval base changes, patrols, movements of naval units to and from strategic warfare boxes. So what we want to say right now is that our one U-boat is gonna go to the Atlantic Strategic Warfare box. Um, so I guess, I guess the main area counts as the Western Atlantic. I guess it looks like the whole damn thing to be honest, but who's counting? Um, so we sent our U-boat out there. Next, we would resolve patrols. Uh, don't think we have any patrols. Um, but that's where you would do that. And then you would resolve base changes and movement of naval units to and from strategic warfare boxes. Um, there's also... Yeah, so that's really it. We just say we're moving there and then we move there. The question is, what is the range of a submarine? I, I assume that you can do this all in one turn, but, but maybe you can't. I don't know why I'm flipping through the record sheet. I should be looking at the rule book. Okay, so in the European theater, you can only move 40 hexes. So yeah, we're, we're, we're easily gonna be able to get to the strategic warfare box. I'm, I'm going to go all in. I'm going to put all of the pocket battleships into the, uh, the Western Atlantic. I don't see a reason not to. And what's the worst that happens? We don't, we lose our Navy. Oh no. Uh, according to rule 21.5331, we can place one or more of our pocket battleships in the Atlantic strategic warfare box during the opening setup. So let's consider that we just did that. Um, so we can group them together in separate rating groups. Uh, I think it's probably more effective to split them up, to be honest. So let's just consider them all separate entities here. And frankly, I'm not going to bother with the task force since I'm playing against myself. I mean, and, uh, I'll do it for the, the fleet action, but not for some, some rating. Uh, so now what I'm trying to figure out is do we get to raid on the same turn we move? I'm assuming so. Because the turns are three months long and you'd easily be able to make it there in three months. Um... I'm also trying to figure out when we resolve the, the actual rating results. Hmm. So the Atlantic Strategic Warfare box is considered to be on the Western Front. Uh, that plays into the, um, the idea of full versus limited versus attrition combat. Because if you spend more than 15 BRPs, which you would include your raiders as your spending, one die is rolled for each raider group to determine how many defending naval units are able to engage that raider group. But what if they don't have any defenders? I guess I'm not understanding... I'm not really understanding what we're trying to do here. I guess, because it's like... Let's read the example. 
That doesn't really help me. Well, I guess they just magically, these, these escorts just magically appear. Let's roll some dice, finally. Spent uh, basically the entire last turn just playing with our little pieces and not doing a whole lot. I'd also unpackage the cards. I know it's a big risk, but I just wanted to, to get them out of the packaging at least. All right, so the way I see it is we have four raiding groups and so let's roll four dice. One, two, three, four. So we got a six, a four, and two ones. So in no particular order, uh, I'm gonna arrange them in the same shape that we are in over here. So six ships engage the Grash Bay, the four ships engage the U-boat, and one each engages the Admiral Shear and the, uh, whatever this other pocket, the Litzau. Litzau. Okay, so we're comparing that against this table here. So let's check out the modifiers. So there's automatically a minus three and then a plus one for each raider group. Oh, maybe that's gonna backfire a little bit. Um, okay, so I guess it's actually a plus three. So we're at zero. Uh, if the raider group contains three ships, plus one, air range results uh, don't have that. Additional Atlantic Mar fires are none of this is taking effect. We don't have any ultra yet. Okay, so basically we get two ships. Well, Yeah, we kind of screwed ourselves by splitting them up, actually. It would have been better to keep them together. I wish I had read this table, but that's okay. So we get one chance each. So that's just going to be a destroyer against each of those. And then we're going to... We're going to roll again, I guess, to get the, the type. So this was just like, does it hit or not, I guess. One die is rolled for each raider group to determine how many defending naval units. Oh, so you would have to roll six times for this first one. Okay, oh geez. Okay, um, all right, so let's do that, let's roll Six dive, get a bunch of carriers come out and schwack these guys up. But, uh, okay, we got one carrier. I don't understand how this can happen when we don't have anything at sea. That's what I don't get. It's just automatic. It seems ridiculous. It seems like it's inevitable that you're going to lose ships then when you're doing raiding. I mean, I guess, I guess you'd want to raid with a smaller amount. That's kind of our mistake. Um, Cause otherwise they just find you and destroy you. Okay, so we got a six, two threes, four and a one. All right, now we combine that onto this chart here. So we have destroyer factor, and then two battleships, and a 
Well, we'll do three battleships and a carrier. That seems like a lot. <laughs> seems like an awful lot. All right. So we'll move these guys over here. Oh, right. We have the, uh, the naval battle charts. Where are those? We could just use this chart to, to hold our units in place. Um, I want to assume it's found, so we'll use this as our indicator. It's a six over here, and then we have we have the six, and then we need some battleships. So we have, let's see, one, two, three factors and a four factor, right? So we send out the War Spite, the Royal Oak, and the Nelson. Jeez, this is a strong force. Along with the Furious. And uh, Destroyer. Oh, but I don't have any Destroyers of that size. Okay. Um, let's trade this on in then for... I don't know if that's legal, what I just did there, but I'm going to say it was. I would assume you can, you can make your forces smaller in that case. Maybe. I don't know. I probably just broke the rules. Whatever. All right. So these guys are all engaging. Okay. Only fast ships may engage raiders in their first engagement. Slow ships may engage a returning raider containing da damaged ships. Okay, so what's considered a fast ship? Is that just the carrier and the battleships? The fast carrier must be fully operational and a sufficient number of light feet. Fleet factors must also gauge. 21.313. Okay. Twenty-one point four. 3.13. Restrictions on fast carrier operations. Fast carriers are in a naval force may conduct operations listed in 20.32 as part of a naval force which contains at least one fast fleet factor for each one fast carrier factor. Uh, question, <laughs> what constitutes fast? I mean... Fast. Um, let's, let's try the index on that one. Here we go. It was in the glossary. Fast carriers basically are fleet carriers and light carriers and super carriers. Escort carriers are not fast carriers. Very good. So that means for back to our rules here. No more than one fast carrier may engage a raider group in each engagement attempt. Luckily, we only have the one. So now the question is, 
Once we determine the types of ships that are engaging, the defender chooses which eligible ships actually engage. If a ship is eligible to engage more than one raider group, the defender chooses which raider group to engage with that ship. Okay. So, what I'm wondering is, are we even allowed these ships? I guess I'm, my executive decision here is going to be, this guy will engage the U-boat. And then these ones will engage the Grash Bay. And then the other two will just be unengaged. I think that's the most beneficial. I, I really don't know... I really don't know if we actually have this set up properly though. My guess is no. So naval combat uses simplified naval combat procedure 22.35. I'm sure it's real simple. <laughs> there it is. Raiders. Naval combat involving raiders in a strategic warfare box is resolved without the need for combat group search and possible surprise. Each force forms a single combat group regardless of size. Each combat group is deemed to have found the other. Neither combat group is surprised. Carrier strikes are resolved. A single round of fleet combat is resolved. If all the unscreened naval units which engaged a raiding group are sunk in naval combat, attacks by transports and raiders which did not engage in naval combat are resolved. Any reinforcing naval units are added to the Western Allied Combat Group and a second round of strikes and fleet combat is resolved. Wonderful. Um, by is resolved. <laughs> I guess... Uh, that's that's next. I was thinking about it a little bit more. Maybe the Furious shouldn't be involved in this because it doesn't even have its air wing assigned yet. We haven't even gone through that turn, that part of the turn. So let's let's leave that out of the fight. It makes it a little bit more even. That means it's just the War Spite, the Royal Oak against uh, the Grafsch Bay. And actually, to make it even more fair, let's say that these guys decided to engage with a destroyer here. Okay, so now we have our three little battles and they're both deemed to have found each other. Now, how do we resolve the naval combat? That's the next question. All right, here we go. Resolving fleet combat. So, our first thing is, obviously we know what kind of ships we have, but the first step in the sequence is that capital ships pair off. So both sides will rank their capital ships as follows. Larger ships are ranked higher than smaller ships, and ships of the same size, faster, are ranked higher than slower. The capital ships then pair off on a one-to-one -one basis. If one side is more capital ships than the other, then the other side is considered to have surplus. Surplus capital ships may either join a friendly capital ship in firing at an opposing capital ship, fire on opposing light ships, or hold fire in hope of firing on opposing screen ships. Resolve the capital ship fire. Okay. So, because we're only going up against a pocket battleship here, both the War Spy and the Royal Oak are going to engage the Grash Bay. So to resolve the fire, a capital ship um, must, which is engaged, which is targeted by one or more of the opposing capital ships, must fire against one of the capital ships firing at it. All the light ships are treated as a single target light ships are sunk by capital fire are removed from the board blah 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 so 
How then do we roll against this table? Okay, here we go. Fleet combat effects are determined by rolling to the two dice and consulting the naval attack table. Fire against a single target is combined and then resolved by a single fleet combat die for that target. A die roll of less than two is treated as two. I get, so I assume AS means air squadrons and FF means fleet factors. So we have eight against, so we have eight fleet flat, yeah, fact, bleh, eight fleet factors. Um, And I guess these results are how much damage we take. So in the eight column, are we gonna get shit auto sunk here? It looks like we might. Because we have a fleet factor of two. And the lowest possible one is a three. So I think we're just kind of screwed. A name ship or cruiser is sunk is damaged if it incurs naval attacks less than its size and factors, and it's sunk if it's greater. So, Grash Bay is sunk. Rip. Rip to that ship. Kablam. You're dead. Alright. Now, this battle is a little closer, so one to two. So, a one... We have to roll an eight or better to get a one. Um, so let's see if that happens. So far, the uh, the dice have not really been favoring Germany. So, and they get a six. So uh, they live to fight another day. For now. So I, th I think it's, I think that's basically it. All right, so I guess, are they allowed to shoot back? That's the, that's the question I'm trying to figure out here. Is the defender shooting back? Withdrawal is always permitted. Either side may withdraw at the end of a round. Uh, that doesn't really apply here. Hmm. Very interesting. Okay, so. I'm just trying to see when, when we pair off, do we then have both sides fight? I 
I think we roll it for both sides. As far as I can tell. Oh, we were supposed to get a plus two. Oh, I guess that would be a plus two and a minus two, so they cancel. Um, all right, well, let's roll the opposing side then of the destroyer combat. So this would roll against the two. Uh, we rolled a seven, so we actually do sink it. So this guy gets sunk as well. Very nice. Um, actually, I should put a two on that other one, right? Since it's technically destroyed. Um, okay, so we got... One of our pocket battleships survives. Now it's the Nelson versus the U-boat, but the U-boat might have a couple of tricks up its sleeve. That's what I'm thinking. So, submarines. All right. Oh, a nine. That's, that's probably the death of this U-boat. Uh, yeah, it is. So, thing is, dead zo. I kind of feel like they should shoot back. Maybe the grass spray should, should get a shot back. Maybe that's not the rules, but I think I'm going to play it like that until I figure it out. So the grass face shot back a 7 and had a 2. So it does do one factor of damage on one of these guys. Um, so just to remember, I'll, I'll actually put this on here. And then I will flip this over to make sure it's dead. So in this case, this is dead. Um, but we can return fire at least. We'd have to roll, I think like a 10 or better the one factor oh no oh an eight uh, so this actually this is interesting now um so i guess i guess that's actually probably pretty good for the germans in some ways they they lose two ships but they also but they damage three or they sink one and damage two so they actually kind of won this won this battle i, I i'm shocked like they got heavily intercepted, but it seriously kind of backfired here. Um, that's very interesting. Uh, I don't really need this because this actually just got got straight up sunk. Okay, cool. So, so these two both got damaged here. I'll just. I'll put them out here so I remember where they were. And then we had two ships get sunk for the, the Germans, but the Graf Spray did go down fighting, so it did do a little bit of damage. And then the War Spite will have to return to port. I assume that means that they can't do any combat or anything next turn. Um, so that's that's really interesting. We had our first kind of big naval fight, um, and overall, Germany came out on top. So their first naval victory of the war, if you can call it a victory, uh, and they still have two raiders uh, available, so they did not get disrupted. Um, now, the question is. What is the result of that? And we'll take a look at that in probably the next video. I assume that affects the BRP side of things. Um, so I'm not going to bother searching for it now, but at least we got the naval battle out of the way. 
And like I said last time, I'm really, really trying to get through the end of this axis turn. That was the, the whole goal of today. Uh, but the naval battle was fun. I mean, I could see when we get to real naval fights with multiple rounds and such, this system is going to be a blast to play. Um, I am pretty surprised about that result. Probably screwed something up. Um, in fairness, I do think it's more realistic to have the even a ship that gets sunk shoot back a little bit based on kind of World War II style naval battles. You know, usually they were in, in close visual proximity, especially early in the war when the radar wasn't too good uh, or wasn't even available. Um, so a lot of the combat happened very, very short ranges, kind of knife fights. A lot of it happened at night. Um, again, short ranges, all of which lends kind of credence to the idea of both sides come away damaged. You look at most naval battles in World War II and usually both sides take some damage, if not losing ships. Even if you win the battle, you might lose ships. So I have no problem with that result as it stands. I will try to find in the rules the official, the official rule on it. But I have a feeling it's going to be kind of like that because it feels more historical um, based on, you know, what little I know about naval warfare in World War II. So that, that kind of, that was a, a bit of a backtrack back to the, the naval warfare phase. Um, but theoretically now, after that, we resolve, we, that was kind of step J of combat. So it's kind of like a rewind. But, um, so we, we resolved our strategic warfare and raiders. Um, so now we would kind of skip back ahead to go and do what's left of our unit construction and naval construction, um, which we don't actually have any limit left on our... So neither side has any points that they could spend. I still have not been able to find if construction of um, like a port counts against counts against our um, construction tool. I I really don't know. I, I don't really have a, a strong feeling either way of uh, if I were gonna kind of homebrew the rule, what would I do? Uh, so I think for now, I'm going to keep searching on it. If I can find a rule that says, yeah, I can totally do what whatever I want. You, It's just the force pool itself that you can't, you can't go exceeding on. Um, then I'll, I'll totally go for it. I'm also not 100% sure on do we have the ability to build ships uh, or do they count against the construction quota? Because I'm thinking that they, they probably do. So it's just very fuzzy to me on, on what the the proper action is but I will uh, keep working on that I'm hoping to find out the uh, the specifics of it but I'm not a hundred percent sure if I can figure it out I will uh, I think we pretty much did all of our accounting work already knocking these freaking things over. So obnoxious. Um, I don't need, I didn't end up needing the, the groups, the combat group 
or the carry group or task force numbers. So put those away again. All right. So let's just try to um, end this turn out. We'll do our construction and then uh, switch over to the, the allied point of view. I did realize that I never went through the U.S. axis tension levels. And there's actually a die roll, which requires you to roll one die. Um, and if you get, um, you, it has a little tiny chart that you can roll against, basically. Got so much crap in here that's not going to be effective. Got a five. So it's a plus one. So our effective U.S. axis tension level is a three. Okay, now for the Russo-German Russo tension level, the RGT. Um, you start with a plus one no matter what. Uh, the Russians um, did not mobilize, I don't think. So let's say zero for that. Poland unconquered. Uh, that's an interesting way to put it. Um, well, it's not unconquered, so we'll call it a zero. Oh, maybe that's supposed to be a five. A little fuzzy on that one. Let's call it a five. Axis penetration of the Balkans. We did have that. Uh, not sure what they mean by that. Axis have attacked or achieved a diplomatic result of seven or more in Hungary. Oh, so we did not get that. So that's a zero. Axis units in Britain, zero. Durant, Japan has not surrendered. They're not even in the game. Territorial acquisitions. Um, we didn't capture any of the key objectives. That would be Paris, London, London, Birmingham, or Manchester. None of those have been captured. Axis expansion um, has not happened yet. Um, that would be expansion into, basically into the either Finland, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, Finland, uh, Bessarabia, or Persia, uh, modern day Iran. Uh, none of those things happened, so that's a zero. The Russians have not penetrated into the Balkans either, so that's a zero. Russians have not expanded yet. Um, so we'll leave that as a zero for now. Current tension change is plus six. It's a really weird way to put it. Poland unconquered. Poland unconquered is a plus five. The way that's worded, it's, it's like a double negative. It makes me think that we should put in a zero. Because I'm pretty sure that our tensions would be pretty low. I mean, we just gave them half a country for, for free. So let's call it a zero. Um, so we're only at a plus one right now. So then the Russians, uh, I guess they might get a chance to mobilize. So we, we can't finish that out until their turn. All right, very cool, very cool. So we pretty much finished up our accounting. What, what's a little weird is that in the book it says your initial level for Germany is 150. Yet in the guidebook here, in the actual sheet, it says it's only 110. I don't know what happened to those other 40. Unless they mean 150 combined on the axis. That's probably what they mean. 
because there's a lot of mentions of the axis axis being 150 so that's probably what it means so but now we're actually up to 170 um, and the way the construction limit thing works is that only gets reassessed in the year start sequence so we have the same construction limits again next turn so a 50 and a 20. Now, one last thing that we have to do for the Italians is actually assign their mobilization points. Um, so by getting a mobilization, they can actually assign eight factors uh, into their force pool, which means they could build an additional eight because they didn't quite spend all their, their money, but they did spend their entire force pool. So what we could do is we could add just another eight factors of infantry. Um, and that might be the best way to do it. Because um, I don't think, don't know if we have a better option. I mean, we, we kind of need planes to be fair. We could use some more planes for sure. I feel like about half of this show is going to be me flipping through pages, not finding what I'm looking for, and I'm having to flip through them again when I pause the video in frustration. <laughs> oh, I'm just, I've, I've been struggling with using this manual. It's, it's, it's definitely me. It's not the, the rules itself. I'm just so unfamiliar with the concept of how they organized it until I really play through a couple of games. I think it's always going to be a struggle. Um, but I mean, I guess that's to be expected with a game that is this, um, big in depth. So here we go. Mobilization increases the force pool of the mobilizing major power. In the turn of mobilization, the mobilizing major power announces and records the types of units being mobilized and when they enter its force pool. Then they place the units in their appropriate location in the turn record tracker. Exceptions, shipbuilding increases, deferred force pool additions, and whatnot. Um, so I guess you could defer force pool additions, but we're not going to. We're just going to do it right now because we want to spend them. So Italy gains eight BRPs of units for each turn of mobilization. We want to add either armor. So that would allow us to do one, two, five armor unit, infantry or army air. I'm just assuming that the, the cost is the same as the cost to, um, to build the things. So I'm, I'm assuming we're using this chart here. And we have eight points to spend. So we would kind of want to do six worth of air, six worth of uh, planes and then the armor unit. Oh wait, no, the armor would be four. Okay, so let's just do armor and... Hmm. We could just build air. Let's just build air. So that would give us two more two-factor... Um, two-factor planes that we can construct. And we will immediately construct them because we, we need air. Italy is... Uh, behind on air. So let's get them going. Let's get them out there. And that'll be their um, last couple points. So that costs us um, eight more on air. So we've spent a total of 16. Oh, we can also spend to accelerate construction. I wonder if that counts against our construction limit. That's what I really am frustrated on. I want a list of what 
counts against construction limit and what doesn't. Because it's driving me nuts not knowing it. Construction cost, construction limits. 27.3. That's the one I've already read a gazillion times. I think we can we can use them to accelerate our construction. So that's what I'm going to do with the, the leftover points that we have. Just a matter of where do we pay it? What are the costs? Accelerating. The construction of three, four, and five factor ships may be accelerated by spending extra three or six BRPs beyond the number three BRP cost of using a shipbuilding point. I guess that would make the Bismarck go down to down one row and one column to the left. So that would be fall of 1940. I assume. I don't know, reading this bloody chart is not the easiest thing in the world. It's like, oof. So I'm thinking that it would be launching in summer 1940 for a cost of 12. So like rush it. So I'm going to note that as accelerated. I could get the Latoro out next tor turn. Latorio. So let's do that. Latorio will come out next turn. Uh, we'll do the same to the Vittorio. The Vittorio Veneto. I assume that's another battleship. So there's our 12 there. So we got two ships coming out next turn. Cool. I'm gonna go back and put that into our accounting sheet, our ledger. All right. So 12 for acceleration for both of them. So we got 49 at the end of the day for, for, um, Germany, mm, 22 for, 22 for the Italians. And then they have the chance to lose more from bombing. So we're not quite done with their accounting, but almost. Um, so just in case there's some bombing, I'll, I'll leave it unfilled for now. Now the very last thing we have to do, and then we can finally close out the access turn is tactical and strategic redeployments. So these last, last couple bullets here. So tactical redeployments and strategic redeployments. And technically we got to uninvert all of our uh, units and get rid of anything that's still overstacked, which we don't have any. So, so that's no, no big deal. We'll eventually have to deal with those damaged units as well. I decided not to delete them. I'll leave them as is, just damaged for now. It's fine. Um, so, let us quickly read up on our redeployments and what we want to do with them. Found the page. So, basically, we're probably going to be strict strategically redeploying almost everything um, and strategic redeployments the basic rules are you can't redeploy right onto the front line makes sense just like in war in the east we must begin and end that strategic redeployment phase in an objective or map board box com controlled by the alliance faction and we can strategically redeploy up to two ground units and five air factors into each objective. Okay, so that's great. 
Uh, we could have also, you can also construct a railhead to be able to redeploy it, strategically redeploy it to it. So that kind of answers the question that I had is, is it when you invade Russia, are you going to be able to bring in reinforcements easily? And the answer is yes. Um, you just can ship them to a strategic railhead. Um, so that kind of eliminates the the axis and allies kind of thing where you're always ki kind of marching guys to the front lines. Um, a game which, honestly, I was trying to get back into with some of my friends and realized that it's just, it was too shallow for me at this point. Um, like once you play one of, one of the big war games, going back to something like Axis and Allies feels, feels kind of bad. I don't know why. Um, not that I would turn down a, a short game of it, but I don't know. It's just not as interesting as it used to be, I guess. When I was a kid, I loved it. But, um, it used to be a lot harder to set it up then, too, so you would get some of the delayed gratification effect. Um, but now when you can play it on the computer, it's frankly not that inexciting of a game, so the whole excitement was moving the little guys around for me. Um, so let's strategically redeploy our units. So we can, we can actually move quite a bit of rounds because we have the ability to move two ground units. So critically, we want to be able to move our um, tanks and infantry over towards France. So for tactical redeployments, um, the only thing is you can't be a, a member of an offensive, which unfortunately everything was. But for strategic redeployments, that's not the case. You could have been in an operation. So we have Warsaw with a 4-6 factor. Uh, we're going to rail him over to Essen, so which is on the Dutch... Dutch-Belgian border. Um, and then for our planes, I'm going to uninvert them and move because they were all in Warsaw. And we want to move them, um, I guess, into Berlin with the idea being to protect Berlin from bombing. Uh, something that's pretty important, I would think. Um, we also want to uninvert these air units and then uh, tactically redeploy them back to, um, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six perfect so now they're back on the port where they started take through all these breakthroughs just trying to clean up the board a bit and then we're going to uninvert our last air factor here and fly him back one two three four uh that was actually Prague, so yeah, he still had two more spaces he could move anyways. Um, this guy's still damaged. These guys are still stationed here. And that's fine. All right. I think that's our moves. What about the Italians? Do we want to do any redeployments with them? Probably not. I like their setup already because they're pretty much there. They're where we wanted them to start with anyway. So we didn't have to do any combat or anything. So Cool. All right. Well, that is the end of the Axis turn. The only two steps on the, on the sequence of play that we did not do at the end here, uh, basically because they don't apply, uh, there's technically steps 10, 11, 
12, 13, 14, and 15, but none of them apply, so we don't have to worry about them. It would be uncontrolled hexes and initially conquered minor countries come under control. We already did that. Uh, voluntary elimination of units. We chose not to do that, although might regret that. Um, and then we can also remove bridgehead counters, determine resistance levels of surrendered major powers. Don't have to worry about that. That's only on allied turn. And then remove damage and firestorm markers. Uh, we're going to leave the, the damage markers on there for now, uh, just because they got hurt. Uh, I need to look up exactly what the status of that is, whether they automatically get back to full strength or whether we have to make some sort of investment at the end of the turn. Um, but I'll check that and then when we're doing the allied turn, I'll just inform you what happened basically. But had an interesting little turn, had our first little na naval battle, which I'm not 100% not convinced we did correctly, but I don't care. I just wanted to fight something. Uh, so relatively low impact anyways. You know, yes, we lost a, a couple of boats for Germany and had a bunch da damaged for the, the Brits, but the Brits have plenty of boats. It's no big deal. Um, the, the Germans, eh, it was worth the, it was worth the risk, I think. Now I just have to figure out the, the effect on the allies from that successful raiding operation. Hopefully it means less BRPs for Britain. Um, so with that, I'll sign off and hope to, hope to see you in another one. See ya.